Now, well, here's the models now. We're back in the exhibition, and in the end we have these, and there you see the hanging one up top, which you will see in your exhibition. Next slide. And uh, uh, here is uh, Maria Gennaro. Uh, she's a graduate student, and she is hanging this cloth, and she is going to be making the Eastler models. Next slide. And here she is putting on a light plaster on the model after a number of different trials. Next slide. And then finally she gets it right. See how happy she is? She gets it right, and these are all the ones that did, she didn't get right. <laughs> she had to throw them all out. She had many, many different trials to get the right kind of form. It was not as easy as it looks. It was a very complicated, not complicated, but a very delicate process, and she worked on it all summer and got it right. Uh, and Isler, who sort of keeps these things to himself, uh, doesn't reveal in detail how he does these things. He reveals in general how he does it. Those pictures of the, of the plastic and the turning it over are his, uh, but he doesn't show how he gets at these kinds of forms here. Next slide. So here they are. Uh, she's pointing out how thin it is on the edges, and this is what is exhibited now in the model. Two of them, Eastler shells. Next slide. And now we come back to Eastler's uh, Eastler's um, uh, notebooks of Laudy's uh, lectures, and uh, these are some bridges, and they will lead us into the bridge designs of Christian Men, because these were also the lectures Men was following. Men did not uh, save his notebooks, too bad, but at least Eastler did. And just to show you what, what happens, here, which is common in bridge design, is to have a much thicker column over the support than you have here. And what, uh, what uh, uh, Lardy is saying here is Schrecken! Rah! I mean, German has wonderful words like that. <laughs> and it just means terrible, awful, dreadful. And uh, don't ever do that, you see. Well, this is the emotion that goes into teaching. And he's telling the students, don't do such terrible things. You know, make this column the same as this. Maybe it's a little longer, so make it a slightly deeper, but don't do it, you see. And that's what he's showing up there in, the, uh, uh, in the, the two examples. One is a completely disorganized design, and the other is more organized. But always, you see, there's no difference in those verticals. They're sketched quickly, and you see it more clearly here. This vertical is not made any more prominent than the others. And uh, what is done and what is uh, uh, exhibited here and is very subtle is the fact that the spacing between them is slightly changed based on the depth of the columns. And visually, that's, that makes a difference if you look carefully at several different alternatives like that. So he's talking about very sophisticated aesthetic changes that you can make, small changes, to improve a, a basic form. Next slide. And here's another example of all this. Uh, designing, and I show the last one down there because this is the thing that stimulates men then when he begins to design his own bridges. Next slide. And the first major one he does, this one is very much like that. And look at the column here. You see, he doesn't make this mistake. They're all just about the same. And uh, this is the Crestobald Bridge in 1958 at the very beginning of uh, men's uh, design career. He form, founds his own company there. He actually gets a PhD from uh, Laudy for a very complicated mathematical study of, of circular, of elliptical staircases, uh, 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 um, uh, cycl cyclical staircases. Next slide. And um, then uh, this is a picture taken by men, now, not my picture, of the Salvina Tobel Bridge. Men is from the Graubünden, so he knows the Almost all his bridges are out there in that wilderness canton. And the next slide now shows uh, the Letzival Bridge, which is also in the Graubünden. And the, here you see he's copying Maillard. It's more or less the same as Maillard's three-hinged designs. So in the beginning, just as many great artists do, they are influenced strongly by their predecessors and begin to work out their own ideas first by, uh, by, by studying what has been done. Next slide. And then the Schwanbach Bridge by Maillard, 1933, probably the most important of these uh, very thin arch bridges of Maillard's. Uh, in, uh, this is in the canton of Bern. And this one stimulates men to rethink that problem, typical Swiss problem of a curved bridge between two mountains where you come down one, you come up, and around the other. 
And so, uh, and Men tackles the same problem, next slide. He does it very differently. This is the Salvanai Bridge, you see, 33 years, 36 years later, and now you don't see any arch at all. And the reason you don't is because hidden in this hollow box up here are cables under very high tension, so-called pre-stressed concrete a new technique which Maillard didn't have available to him and which came in use after, in, in general use after World War II. Maillard died in 1940. And so Men is using that to design an even more uh, slender, even more simple kind of form. And this is in the Italian-speaking part of the Graubünden. And so it's no, uh, it's no surprise that this minimization of form should appeal to people in a in a wilderness canton that has no natural resources, and therefore we're not surprised that of all the modern artists, the one who stripped down form the most is one who comes from this very region in the Graubünden. Next slide. I speak, of course, of, of the great Swiss sculptor Alberto Giacometti. And uh, <clears throat> so it's an image of this stripping down, which is part of the idea of structural art. You don't add a whole lot of flourish and stuff. You strip it down, but you're still concerned about the aesthetics of the form. Next slide. Now, Men then enters, becomes well known after 1969, and enters some big national design competitions. Switzerland is famous for that. They do more of that than any other country, and that's one of the reasons they have this tradition. And this is the Felsenau Bridge outside of Bern, which was the biggest project in Switzerland at the time. Uh, Men wins the competition with a design that is uh, one of the, not the only, but one of the least expensive uh, of the uh, competitors. Next slide. And here it is completed in 1974. And next slide uh, shows you the Sunniberg Bridge uh, some 25 years later. Now what Men is doing here in the Felsenau, which is generally considered the nicest of these hollow box, pre-stressed concrete bridges, is he is criticizing it himself. And he is saying, well, it's a little bit heavy here, and these two columns are not very expressive. And so when he gets a chance, then later on, he designs this bridge in which he gives the columns considerable life that the Felsena doesn't have. And instead of having haunches down here, he uses very light cables up top, which make it more transparent. Now, the span is the same as Felsenau, just about. And the textbooks say when you have spans of 500, 600, 800 feet, use a hollow box. Use a hollow box concrete. That's what everybody says. Men said, why? Why do I do that? I want to try something different, and particularly in this valley. The picture is not good enough to show the valley in its proper uh, elegance. It is the Pretigau in the Graubünden, and uh, Klosters is the city at the very edge of the end of that valley. It's one of the most beautiful valleys in Switzerland, the most beautiful valleys anywhere. As you know, Switzerland was actually invented by Eastman Kodak. <laughs> so it's, uh, so <clears throat> uh, the idea of building a standard bridge across that valley in a project which involves tunnels and lots of roadway and other bridges, a two or three billion dollar project, and he is willing to spend. It's a little more expensive than the hollow box, about 15% more. But 15% more means something of the order of five or six million dollars more on a, on a project overall, which is a couple of billion dollars. It's lost. In other words, there's no difference hardly. And this is the one expressive feature of that, of that whole project. So he justifies that, and he was able to convince the story of how he got the commission to do that is a story that's worth a lecture in itself. I won't go through the next slide uh, <clears throat> itself. But here is men explaining this design to me. And that's why it's very important, because this design, I just didn't understand how it worked. I really didn't understand how this worked. And I was trying to figure it out, and men explained it to me very patiently. Sometimes he gets a little impatient. He expects a professor to know more than uh, they do. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, eventually he got it across, and we wrote, one of my graduate students and I then wrote a paper uh, which got published in our best bridge journal on the conceptual design of the Sunni Berg Bridge. It is a fascinating, uh, fascinating article because it's just taken from men. In fact, it's a translation of his article then with uh, additional commentary and numerical study. Next slide. And here are, the, here are the two bridges of men in the exhibition. 
the Felsenau Bridge in the front and the Sunniberg Bridge in the back. So we make those comparisons. And next slide. Here is uh, Courtney Clark, who was uh, 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 in uh, <clears throat> 04 and who went on to graduate study and is now practicing structural engineering in New York. And she was the designer and builder of those two models. And next slide. And they are here she is again explaining what she's doing. She did the whole thing first in a foam kind of plastic in this. Uh, here they are in the exhibition. Now the, uh, the uh, design of the, uh, of the, this you see the, is the, of course the Felsenau Bridge on the left, next slide, is going to be a new bridge of men's. The head of the physics laboratory, whom we called in at the last moment to help us anyway, and the idea was we'll fake it. We'll fake it. And so when you go in the museum, what you do is you look underneath, and you will see underneath that is a very stiff but very shallow steel beam which holds that plexiglass in place. And so it's not, of course, in men's. And men, when he saw the model, didn't even notice it. I didn't tell him. <laughs> and he didn't notice it, fortunately. So, uh, <clears throat> but now you will know it. But it's really an important part of the experience is the fact that you had to do something, and it wasn't exactly what you wanted, but it didn't really change the aesthetics of the bridge, uh, at least of the model. And it nevertheless got the thing done in time. And as Joe Vocatoro said, he was convinced when we started this project that he was going to be the day before the model, the exhibition opened, he was going to be carrying the last model over to the uh, museum. And indeed he was. He carried that over the day before the exhibition open. So when you look at the model, you'll see that and you can tell your friends to, that you've uh, discovered this uh, strange little anomaly in that design. Okay, let's go ahead. Next slide. We've seen those. Next slide. Next slide. All right. And then this is men's bridge for the Boston uh, Big Dig. It's the, got this complicated na name, Leonard, Zakem, uh, Leonard P. Zakem Bunker Hill Bridge, completed in 2002. It's more or less become uh, a major uh, logo for Boston now. Uh, it's an extraordinary design. It's somewhat complicated, uh, and it's a very complicated problem to get it in. Now, it would have been cheaper to use a hollow box again. And, uh, but here it wasn't men's decision. The commissioners and the le leaders had decided they wanted a cable stayed bridge. They wanted a bridge you could see instead of just a plain line. So again, 15, maybe 20% more cost for this project, uh, they justified. Because, of course, the whole thing, they didn't realize then, of course, how much it was really going to cost. But uh, it did, it, even based on the original estimates, this was such a small percentage that they decided to go ahead with that. And then there was a competition, not a proper one, but they made a different, uh, made a, uh, <clears throat> a, 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 a number of different designs. And uh, when uh, Men was giving a lecture at Harvard, the D School of Design, there was an architect who was on the commission uh, of the Boston Commission for this, uh, heard L Men's lecture, saw what Men was doing, and came up to him afterward and said, why don't you come over and look at what we're struggling with with this bridge? So Men came over, looked at it, and typical of Men, he his, says his phrase, he looked at the designs and says, they are completely wrong completely wrong. What he meant was there could be a slightly better uh, design. <laughs> so so it's, it's, a, it's a liberal translation. Anyway, uh, so what he did was he went back to Zurich, to Kur, where he lives in the Graubünden. He got his model maker, and on the plane back, he designed this bridge. He went to his model maker. He had a model built. He put it into a, a case. Two weeks later, he was back in Boston, assembled the model in front of them, and he said, there's your bridge. Well, they, were, they were, of course, charmed, and he explained it to them, why it had the form it did, and so forth. And so they accepted it, much to the distress of many of the American designers, uh, and it got built. So that's the uh, story behind that uh, extraordinary uh, bridge. Next slide. 